folks, I'm Chris and I'm your Commander Mechanic, here with a special episode. We're calling this Let's Do a Brew, part podcast, part live deck build, special guests. This week, we've got Dylan and Cam from Play to Win. And welcome to Dylan and Cam from Play to Win. Guys, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, great to be here. Uh, amazing, amazing. So for anybody that's not aware of Play to Win and Dylan and Cam and the great stuff that they do, uh, they do a CEDH gameplay channel. Guys, why don't you tell us a little bit about Play to Win? Sure, yeah, we run a CDH uh, gameplay channel. Normally, we try to find what the best something is in CDH. So a lot of our themes in the past, we have theme games. What's the best three color deck? What's the best creature deck in CDH? Um, so we try to do that. We like to have fun when we're playing CDH. We're not super cutthroat. We're not super, you know, trying to, you know, we're just, we're trying to play the best cards and have a good time, so. Fantastic. And that's why people love your channel as well. You get the real camaraderie feeling about sitting around a table because uh, yeah. you guys uh, you guys have played together a lot. How long have you been playing together? You're surprisingly not as long as you might think. <laughs> yeah. Although we may have the rapport of a team that's been together for 15 years, we've been friends for actually... Like a year? A year at this Around point? A year? Oh, yeah. I think, yeah. Yeah, so weirdly enough, um, so we got met, we got introduced through our girlfriends and we both found out that we both played Magic um, and I was actually just looking for more people to play CDH with. I actually couldn't find like a local group to play with. Right. I was a modern player at yeah. the time, actually. Ah. Um, and I, I was just, I had just been like looking through the internet for CDH stuff for years at that point um, and I just needed to find an actual group. So I figured if I could convince my friends to start a YouTube channel with me, and give them an excuse like we have to play i need a video for the channel then i would get to play cdh um so it has kind of evolved that from a reason for me to play to now we have a channel but it turns out it's grown to become my favorite format <laughs> at this point too I, i've always loved the more competitive side of modern i used to like going to some of the more local grand prix if i could and playing them um but i also was a big fan of like the vintage cube and doing some broken things oh, yeah. and having a competitive format that allows me to be as broken as possible really is my favorite outlet of yeah. the game so far Absolutely, absolutely. And, and and you've touched on why CEDH is a big thing for a lot of people, right? It's much easier to find somebody willing to play CEDH than it is to find somebody willing to play vintage out in the wild, right? Oh, 100%. Yeah. yeah, the deck of decks availability, only having to buy one of each busted expensive card yeah. instead of four of them is also a lot easier too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of upside. Fantastic, fantastic. And, and I know that, Dylan, your roommates typically play with you in your videos as well, right? Yep, yeah. My roommate, Tyler and Brandon, uh, and then we also have a buddy, Nate, who comes over. Now that um, COVID, we're in the yellow zone, so we can have him come over again. But yeah, the, uh, yeah my roommates play Magic with us, too. Uh, fantastic. And, and did you rope them into this the same way that you roped Cam into this? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Um, Tyler was our resident casual player. We I had been playing EDH with him for a while, but he was very against combos and very against the CEDH. Uh, and then eventually, I, I lured him over to the dark side. Um, and then my other roommate, Brandon, managed uh, a local card shop, and he had played Magic in a billion different different formats, but was never really all in on CDH. Um, and since we started, I think he's, he's liked it a lot. Right on, right on. Uh, yeah, and EDH and CEDH is one of those things that when you get into it, when it gets its hooks into you, you don't want to go back as well. Like it's, right. it's tough playing casual magic after you've been playing competitive for a 100% while. 100% agree. Right? <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah, it's a completely different feel. It's uh I hate to say it, but it feels a little bit more like a chore at some point. <laughs> <laughs> with the CDH decks, we at least we know there's a win condition coming. Sometimes with the casual decks, we're like, okay, we're just going to attack each other with 12-12 until we're dead. I got to get to bed at some point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, with, with that being said, I know that you guys have had some marathon CDH games as well. <sighs> yeah, that's true, too. <laughs> yeah. Um, the format can get pretty grindy. Yeah, I, I think the, the misconception is because it's a turn four format, people think that it always ends on turn four or because it's a turn three format or however you want to characterize it. And really what that means is it just has the opportunity to end then. But if it doesn't end then, we've had games go past turn 10, just unable to find a win condition. If everyone's playing grindy blue decks, sometimes it's difficult to resolve anything. So you're just grinding it out. Right, right. And with the CEDH meta changing with the flash ban as well, we're seeing a lot more creature-based decks come out is that what you're seeing as well yeah i think i think so definitely 100 we, we've noticed yeah. swords to plowshare become a lot more popular for a while swords was not really necessary but now if i'm playing a white deck in cdh i think i'm playing swords 
Uh, yeah, like I'm definitely playing swords. Yeah. Um, Seedborn Muse is very powerful, and Thrasios decks are now coming with a package of creatures that are just value engines that need to get off the board. You're also finding that a lot of the combo packages now just have a creature involved with them in some sort of fashion. Right. I mean, you still see, you know, Fish and Demonic Consultation come out. You can't really do Swords to Plasha there, but there's a lot of other scenarios with um, different combo packages that having that instant speed, one mana removal spell um, that will exile a creature is still going to be uh, very helpful and prominent to disrupt those combos. Yeah, and one kind of strange thing that I've noticed is what's I've seen a lot of combos shifting to um, more creature-based combos. Mm -hmm. So like comboing with Dockside Extortionist and Teamer Sabertooth. Sabertooth. Yeah. Or I mm -hmm. think the card is Sigil Tracer mm -hmm. is the Merfolk that you can tap one. I think that Sigil Tracer with um, Dramatic Reversal. Yep. So you're playing these creature combos to avoid... Um, being able to be stopped by like Flusterstorm and, and negate and, negate and yeah. things like that. But then at the same time, you're then weak to Swords to Plowshare. So it's a little circle that kind of goes around and around. Right. It's the rock, paper, scissors of exactly. any meta. Any format is going to get into that situation, right? Which is good that now that Flash is gone, we actually have rock, paper, scissors rather than just Flash, Flash, Flash. Yeah. It's nice. <laughs> and, and that's one of the things that I've noticed as well. I, you know, I, I play CDH quite a bit too. And I've noticed that with the Flash ban, win cons have gone from winning at instant speed to relying on sorcery speed win cons and relying on creatures more often. And grinding out straight value out of decks is more important now than rushing a win more often than not. Definitely. And I, I think it's also like we've, we've everyone has talked about Flash ad nauseum at this point. But one of the main, I think, reasons why it is so nice to not have Flash is a lot of times you never saw the Flash win coming. They would just end of turn Mystical Tutor on their turn, you know, um, Summoner's Pack. That's the green one. Yeah, yeah. Summoner's on, Pack. On their turn, Summoner's Pack for the Hulk. And then just like out of nowhere, they have it. Whereas now you have like the Demonic Tutor on turn one. And then like two turns later, Vampiric Tutor. So then you go, aha, that, you know what I mean? Like Dylan's been yeah. putting something I, I together. Over Whereas here. the Flash yeah. decks, like they just didn't give you any time to prepare. Right, right. And I've seen that in some of your recent gameplay as well, where somebody will tutor two or three times in consecutive turns. And yeah. you, you'll come in with your commentary. Okay, we know he's doing something. We know that he's got all of his combo pieces in hand at this point. Right. Right. It is tough to be conspicuous. At yeah. That point. Right. <laughs> and now you, you mentioned a little bit when, when talking about CEDH decks, uh, you mentioned packages. And packages are something important with CEDH. When you want to do something, there's typically a standard best set of cards that you want to include that does that. So if you want to tutor up creatures, there is a set of cards for every color that you want to be including, basically. And right. that's how I feel CEDH deck building differs from deck building for other power levels as well, because in CDH you always want to be using the best cards for the best situations. How do you feel about that? Definitely. I think also, since it's a singleton format, the package thing is much more relevant. Whereas in maybe another format, your card draw would just be like four Dark Confidant. But now your card draw has to be kind of a package that can utilize different things together. It's um, a Dark Confidant. It's a Necropotence. But then you also have to branch into other colors so that you can get some of these other, you know, better card draw things. Right. So right. normally when you could just run four ofs of two or three cards that do the, the thing that you want, in CDH, you have, to, you have to get the packages. Like you said, you have to find the packages that allow you to do a full thing. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's why I'm seeing a lot of decks tend towards more colors. That's why the partners are uh, are that much more prevalent as well, because the more color identity you have, the more options you have in those packages, the better the cards you can use in them are. Why not include black so you can include all of the best tutors? Why not include blue so you can include all of the best card draw? Why not include green so that you can get all of your ramp? Yeah, yeah. Once you get away from the casual mindset of EDH, where like when you're in casual, you're just like, how do I make the best synergies? How do I make my deck the most fun? How do I make my deck the most interesting and unique? But once you decide, well, how do I make my deck the best? Period. The most optimal. You right. get to the same conclusions. Well, I should be running black so I can run Demonic Tutor, Imperial Seal, Vampiric Tutor, so I have three extra copies of my best card no matter what. But I should also be playing green so that I can be playing all my mana dorks I and be also faster be faster than my opponents. And casting Sylvan Libraries to also have right. some card advantage there too. Exactly. Um, and since the commanders, the partner commanders, like you said, allow you to so easily be in four colors and not tied down to a specific strategy, you're just Thrasios is, well, I mean, I now Training Grounds has made Thrasios its own strategy, but for yeah. a lot of those commanders, they're just, 
they just draw cards. They're just good value engines. Right, right. Like the the Timnas and the Thrasios, right? You Timnas, include Thrasios, them so even Crown, Crown. Yeah. yeah, they just draw cards. Exactly, exactly. So that you've got part of that draw engine in your command zone, right? Yep, and and exactly. I, I've noticed that with the partners, people have been moving away from using a combo engine in their command zone. Like with the the Godos and the Yisons and the monocolor strategies, where you can run essentially a one and a half card combo to win in a CDH deck, people are just including more colors so that you can get more of that value. Yeah, your your commanders, uh, the commanders that you have for your partners are really just your color identity at that point. You know, it, it's a lot less that you know this this is the deck. This is the exact strategy is built around them. It's a lot more so. I'm playing these two because I, I need these colors. I want to be able to cast these spells. Yeah. And I've also found having the draw engine in the command zone is better than having the combo piece in the command zone. Um, we talked about this a little bit before, but just because, one, everyone sees it coming. So if you're playing Najila, everyone knows Derevi is coming. Everyone knows that they need to keep up blockers or whatever the case may be. They, they see it coming. And it's a little bit less reliable. Whereas if you have two draw engines in your command zone, no matter what, you're starting the game with nine cards in your hand and you're going to be drawing extra cards against three opponents, which you need to be doing. Yeah. Be having a combo piece, yes, that means you can like go for the combo sooner, but all three of your opponents saw it coming and have drawn cards and can stop you. And it makes it a lot harder to try to combo the second time then as it gets more and more expensive every right. time you do. Exactly, exactly. Like you said, with something like Swords to Plowshares being more prevalent in the format, the last thing that you want to do as a Najila player is burn turns three and five recasting Najila, right? Right, yeah, exactly. Yep. Perfect, perfect. So uh, I, I, on, on the topic of partner commanders, healthy for the format, or do you think that the format's really warped around them? What do you think? I, I'm i a huge fan of partner commanders. <laughs> I think the partner commanders give you this optimal level of customization to the format that still has a little bit of like a casual aspect for it. You know, you're able to play, you know, your favorite flavor of whatever your favorite one is. I'm a huge Timna fan. I love Thrasios and Timna right now because it's just the best. But I also love Crown. So if I, you know, if I'm just in the mood, I might <laughs> want to play a little bit more Curiosity Control. You know, I still get to play my favorite partner, but I'm also to be able I'm also able to do a different flavor of whatever that commander is. Now, when I was, you know, playing Teferi, you know, that's not the same thing. You know, Teferi, <laughs> you're Teferi and this is what you're doing. Yeah. There's yeah. no room for any kind of switch up. And for someone like me who's got a short attention span for decks sometimes, it, it's kind of nice to have that extra, um, you know, leverage. Flexibility, with, kind in, of. With who I want to be playing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I kind of mainly agree. I, I like the commanders because they're powerful and I like playing the powerful cards. And I like being able to kind of change my four color deck to have red or blue or white or black and just switch up my partner with Thrasios. It's fun for a competitive aspect of Commander, but I also acknowledge that it's like pretty terrible for casual EDH. The fact that they're all just generically decent, you know what I mean? For yeah. the most part, some of the Boros one and the and the blue black one are a little are have more specific, but a lot of them are just like good card draw engines, which is kind of boring for I, I will say that I think some of the more newer partners like that came out with Partner I, with? Yeah, yes. the partner with with Ikoria and even the Battle Bond. I, I kind of like that direction a little bit more for, for yeah, casual. Definitely. Um, yeah, I, I like certainly don't think that we don't need any just partner commanders. We don't need any more of them. I think we have a good number of them. There's a yeah. good number of flexibility. Two of each is perfect. Yeah. But I would love to see more partner with at least. Yeah. Right. And Dylan, I know that on a recent episode, you brewed up an early build of Brawlin and Shabraz. Yeah. Right. Uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I think those commanders are great. I, I love the partner with ones. Uh, and uh, how did you find building that deck? Since I know that at the time it was just after Brawlin and Shabraz were spoiled. Uh, yeah. So, so brewing a deck from scratch, which is almost a rarity in CEDH now, it is. how was that process for you? Did you collaborate? At all? Um, kind of not really. I definitely did. I looked, um, I kind of came up with my list before I looked at too many um, other Brawlin and Shabraz lists, but where I got my ideas was still from other lists. It's not like it all came from my brain. So I went to the CDH decklist database, and normally the first thing I'll do when I'm making a new CDH deck is find what decks are similar to it. So the Brawlin and Shabraz list, I kind of knew early on that it was gonna, I was gonna try to push it in a wheels direction. That just seems like what the deck wants to do naturally. So I just first looked to Opus Thief and what cards from Opus Thief could be transferred over. Um, and then from there, kind of filled in the slots. Uh, I noticed that I didn't really need to be activating any abilities, so I want to make sure Curse Totem is in there. And I also noticed that I didn't really have a ton of creatures that needed to stay on the ground, so I could up my sweepers. I could have a Pyroclasm. I could have a Anger of the Gods if I needed to. I can go in that direction too. Yep. 
So initially I start with a, a package or a shell from another deck or something, take out the colors that I don't want and just kind of fill in the slots that I think it needs. I think that's the best way to describe how I, how I begin the process. Yeah. Uh, and again, that, that just loops back to our talk about packages as well, how they're, they're kind of ubiquitous and they can slot into anything as long as you're using that color identity. Right, yeah. So if you know you want to be playing wheels and you're in Jeskai colors, automatically Alms Collector, Narset, Wheel of Fortune, Smothering Windfall. Tithe. Yeah, Smothering Tithe. You have... Uh, Notion uh, Thief, no, even. No, we're, oh, not, we're in not in those We're not in Jeskai, but it, <sighs> right. Notion Thief is in the wheel package. It's a package for wheels. When you're not playing exactly, or exactly. And that's how versatile it is. When you want to play with the best cards for the best situations and the best color identities, you just go and you pluck them out of some of those existing packages. Right? And again, customizable. You know, we're in yeah. Jessica. You know, I thought we're in Grixis. But, you know, we're in, we're in Jessica, you know, so we have some flexibility. Maybe I just color preferences. I don't want to play more white instead of black. You know, right. maybe I, if I feel in something different the other way, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you want to switch up the deck in between, you know, weeks, if you're, you know, playing, uh, playing with friends one week and then the same guys the next week, you can come and pivot that deck by removing, you know, a third of the cards, slotting in new ones. And you've got a brand new deck that feels different. Yeah, definitely. And with Brawlin and Shabbat specifically, something that I never really considered until I saw everyone working on the primers is everyone also decided that this should be a Blood Moon deck. I didn't even really think about <laughs> Brawlin and Shabbat as being a Blood Moon deck, honestly. So that's something that you can like surprise your group with like, haha, my three color deck, surprise, I have a Blood Moon. And then if you're in CDH pod, that's probably going to shut everyone out if they weren't expecting that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, when you're running red and blue like that, you want the back to basics, you want the Blood Moons, especially when people are using the greedy four color, five color color Absolutely. databases as well yeah and i yeah and i think it, it's important to notice to, and to acknowledge when you're building a deck that there are so many people that are so much smarter than you and are thinking about magic more than you even if you are like me and you think about magic 24 7 there is someone who has thought about the deck that you want to build just as much so use your resources use the internet find the packages look at the cdh decklist database find what other people are doing and then also remember that they're people and then they make mistakes and they put bad cards in there too and make your own judgments but I think it's net. There's too many cards. You don't know them all. Exactly. Find a resource. You know? And that's why I, I like deck building as a collaborative exercise as well, because you get to pull on the experiences from other people. You get to talk to them about what's better in the meta, what's better uh, overall. And you get some ideas and cards that pop up that you haven't necessarily thought about or wouldn't necessarily think about. And here on Commander Mechanic, when we do our deck tune-ups, of course, that's just me taking a look at somebody else's deck. Our comments are filled with people saying, what about this card? What about this card? Have you thought about this as well? And that's one of the best things about EDH2. Not only do you get to build your own deck and you get to make it feel and function the way that you want it as well, but it's a community exercise where you get to talk to other people and say, you know, I, I've run this deck and I felt like that card doesn't work in it. I've replaced it with this. Right. Or, you know, uh, I've seen recent discussions lately about Asna, uh, Adnaz decks dropping things like Force of Will just to bring the curve down that much shorter. Right. Right. You know, yeah. That, there have been a lot of very cheap counter spells that have been printed lately that are being much more considered now. Right. Basically the same like thing uh, as like the Will, latest so. M21 uh, miscast. Right. It's right. The, yep. the negate force spike. Or negate uh, spell pierce, rather. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And effectively, a lot of times, it's just going to be a blue counter spell. You know, CH deck players can't keep up the three mana, um, and it's not going to nug you for five when you add not. So I, I definitely could see a, an argument for that. Right, exactly, exactly. And, and speaking of new M21 cards, that brings us to why we're here today is uh, you had mentioned on Twitter the new Conspicuous Snoop card from M21. Uh, Conspicuous Snoop is a 2-2 goblin for red red that reads play with the top card of your library revealed. Uh, you can cast goblin cards from the top card of your library. And as long as the top card of your library is a goblin, Conspicuous Snoop has all activated abilities of that card. Oh, that card's going to be totally fine. Yeah. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> No busts anywhere. Three lines of text <laughs> on a two-mana creature. I, everyone has to be paying attention, right? Right away, just, there's three different things. That's a lot of things for two-mana creatures. That's just a rare, too, right? Yeah. That's not even a mythic? Yeah, it's just a rare. Right, right. And you posed the question, 
is this something that could function in CDH? And that's why I wanted us to take some time today and talk about how Conspicuous Snoop and its combo package, which people have already discovered and people are already talking about, how it fits into existing decks and how we can build a deck around it as well. Right now, yeah. uh, the uh, the combo package for Conspicuous Snoop is Conspicuous Snoop, uh, either Bogart Harbinger, which tutors a goblin card to the top of your library, or Goblin Recruiter. And as long as you have the two of those, you tutor up Kiki Jiki to the top of your library so that Conspicuous Snoop can now make infinite copies of Conspicuous Snoop. And you get a million Conspicuous Snoops. And with the last in your line of Conspicuous Snoops with Kiki Jiki's ability, you copy either the Harbinger or the Recruiter again to put Mog Fanatic on top of your library and just machine gun your opponents down, sacrificing that line of Snoops. Right? Yep. So that's a nice, efficient combo package. That's a nice, efficient combo line. How does that compare to some combo lines in CDH as it is? Well, I think first thing, think first thing to consider is how much mana it costs. So the first thing is the Goblin Snoop costs, Conspicuous Snoop costs two mana, and then you need two mana for the Tutor, right? I think the Recruiter, three mana. Recruiter is two, one and a red, and Bogart Harbinger is three, two colorless and a black. Okay. So how much mana total, is that Let's five, see. six, seven mana total that you have to spend? Uh, so it's four total if you okay. go with Recruiter and Snoop. If, okay. if you're Harbinger and Snoop, it's five total. Okay, so right there, four and five mana is the same. That's that's good, right? That's bad nausea yeah, right that, there. Yeah, yeah, four and five mana with two cards only. To me, that's right around the level. Normally, my like bare minimum for a CDH combo is it has to be less than six mana. Um, the right. reason I say that is because t Tainted Pact and Jace Wielder of Mysteries oh. is a kind of popular backup plan for a lot of decks. Mm -hmm. If you you know if you lose on the Thassa's Oracle. So six mana is kind of like the top of the cap of how much you want to be spending on a combo. And this is four and five mana. So already, I think it's something to consider at least. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and we've seen similar combos to this in existing shells as well. Uh, I know that uh, Grenzo Dungeon Warden runs a Doomsday package that this almost slots into perfectly. What's your yeah. opinion on that? Definitely. I mean, basically into the Grenzo deck, you just have to put Conspicuous Snoop in the deck and then almost all of your combo pieces, like the deck was already running all of, a lot of the Goblin Tutors and stuff. I think you probably have to add Bogart Harbinger, but Grenzo was also playing some already questionable cards that you could pretty easily swap out for that. Right. Um, I think Grenzo would be a great slot for this. In Grenzo, you already have, with Grenzo out, you can cast Doomsday and for two mana extra win the game. This gives you more options with Doomsday Piles, although, to be honest, I haven't thought about specifically what the Doomsday Pile with Grenzo and Conspicuous Snoop would be. Right. But the fact that you have a backup plan with Conspicuous Snoop not needing Doomsday, that's pretty nice if someone takes your Doomsday. Yeah, because before Grenzo was really like you you cast Doomsday and that's really your, that's your only deck. win condition. Yeah, yeah I mean, right. thank God you're in black, right? You have yeah. all the tutors. Right. Um, but this kind of adds like a whole new level that this deck can attack on. And um, I mean, it, it's kind of nice that you even have options for this this uh, this Snoop package and even Mono Red in a lot of times even. So there's even, you know, directions where maybe Godo could, you know, maybe, maybe that's not a great idea, but, you know, <laughs> it's, it's an option, but right? It might even yeah, open absolutely. like some other kind of, um, you know, Pashalik Mons desk. Yeah. I'm just throwing up like goblins <laughs> off the top of my head at this point. But, you know, there's a lot of cool other places that uh, a small package like this can even slot into. Right. Crazy. It, it is a really <laughs> efficient package and can be run in one color, two color, or more as well. Because if you're running Kiki Jiki, you can run additional Kiki Jiki lines as well. So if, yep. if you're running this in a monocolor deck, then you've got the Snoop, Recruiter, uh, Kiki Jiki, and Fnatic. That's your package. That's, that's your win package right there. If you're right. in black, you add redundancy because now you get to run Harbinger as well. Then if you add more colors like blue or green, you can run additional options for Kiki Jiki to just win as well, right? You can run the Pestermites. You can run the uh, Hijack's Tower Scouts, which is the green creature that does the same thing. 
Uh, even yeah. White has Village Bell White, Rager. And White has too. a couple as well, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So now you get into more versatile packages and more versatile lines, as we were talking earlier for deck building. So uh, that, that raises the question here. Uh, is this better to slot into an existing deck or is this better to brew something around? Because I've seen really interesting lines as well using Hulk too, because this is a package that can be just tutored up with Hulk. Yeah, it's, it's hard to say what's better, right? So I think, although this card specifically seems like whoever made it is a Grenzo player, I'm almost positive of <laughs> right. it. You know what I mean? Like it's made for that deck, but also in decks like Blood Pod, who are using Kiki Jiki with Birthing Pod, Conspicuous Snoop will probably find some home in there. If you're playing Blue Pod, if you're playing any type of Birthing Pod or creature related Kiki Jiki deck, which there are a decent amount of Kiki Jiki decks in CEDH, if you're winning with creature combat, infinite combat, normally Kiki's the way to do it. Right. Um, and my, I think my weirdly favorite thing about this is, number one, you have a decent amount of Goblin Tutors, but all of your Goblin Tutors can also find Dockside Extortionist, yes. which is like the craziest ritual ever. Absolutely. Um, so being able to like so easily also turn your Goblin Tutors into tutoring for wind conditions, tutoring for Goblin Extortionist or uh, Dockside Extortionist, or tutoring for some other type of weirdly specific Goblin that can help you in a weird situation. Right. I think, like you said, that the, your package gets bigger and bigger depending on which colors you want to go into. And Chris, you mentioned Hulk too, and it's kind of nice being in green when you also have ways to search for Dockside Extortionist. If you play the, again, Teamer, Teamer uh, Sabertooth, the Teamer Sabertooth, you know, that's a whole other package now that you have. Right. Now your package is interlaced, which is the best thing ever when you can have two separate packages that work together in a way. Exactly. That's why Flash. That's why Flash Hulk and Demonic Consultation with Thassa's Oracle was so powerful. Is your Thassa's Oracle was good with Consultation and with Flash. Right. When your packages interlock like that. I don't know why I'm showing you so much. My fingers, you understand what <laughs> two, interlock Two is. great tastes that taste great together, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and that's what I feel is a, a crux of CDH as well. The more redundancy you can have in some of your win cons and in some of your packages, the, the better the cards function on their own as well as together, the fewer wasted spots. You have to, yep. right? Uh, if you want to run something like Goblin Matron in your deck to tutor up a goblin. Which you definitely should, I think, if you're running any of these goblins. Absolutely. But you can also pivot. And if you're on the back foot, you can grab that Dockside Extortionist so that yep. the next turn you've got enough mana to, say, hard cast Kiki Jiki if he's in your hand. Or, hell, if you're in green as well, you can hard cast a Hulk with the treasure tokens that you've made off of a dark Dockside Extortionist right, yeah. as well, right? So, uh, and, you know, if you're adding in additional colors and if you're looking at a Hulk line too, we want to be looking at things like Veral's Hulk as an example of maybe a Jund Hulk build with the Snoop package in it, where you're looking to discard and reanimate Hulk and sacrifice him in order to pull out your entire package, right? And that definitely. kind of thing I, can be efficient. Yeah, definitely. I think there's not a Jun commander that is a sack outlet yet, uh, right? There, Prosh is, and then I would argue that Corvold would also be able to But is Prosh an actual similar. sack outlet? Yeah, it's a free sack. Sacrifice it's a, a creature to outlet. give him plus yeah. one, plus zero. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so maybe... It if, makes it a lot less efficient, though. You know, yeah. I think there's certain color combinations where you'll really want to lean more on a conspicuous Snoop package yeah. here, but I think that the, a color combination like Jund, while it might seem kind of like the ideal colors to be in for a combo like this may not necessarily be the most efficient way. Now, I mean, that being said, you could also play other things like um, Viscera Seer, you know, so there's a <laughs> lot of other stack free stack outlets that are out there in the format too that are even less mana than like Varals or yeah. something like that. But, but the issue with Hulk now, Hulk was so good is because Flash made it so efficient to get in, but right. now with Hulk, you have to find a way to cheat it in and find a way to kill it as well as it being basically a completely dead card when you can't do both of those things. Yeah. I don't know if, I mean, it's still a fun card to brew around for sure, but I don't know if it's it's where I would start with uh with the with the conspicuous noob. Mm -hmm. But I definitely it's 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 in the realm of possibilities. There's a I lot think. of options that go along with it. Right, right. And, and speaking of options, uh, I, I agree that there's no really efficient Jund commander right now. Even the ones that we mentioned are six mana, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, and, well, Corvold, I do think is is decent. It's five mana, but I understand what you're saying. There's no tier one clear Jund commander for sure. Right, right. If there were a Jund commander that were three mana, that was a value engine in the command zone as well, something that did something on draw, on attack, on sacrifice, something like that, then I would agree that, that Jund would be much more efficient. So now let's bring up the opportunity here. We spoke about partner commanders earlier. 
What about something like a Vile Smasher Thrasios build where we go? Well, I'm even color. thinking like Tim Natana even too. Yeah, yeah. Tim um, Natana. Yeah, I, I definitely like Blood Pod Tim Natana with a creature based deck like this. But I'm not sure if that's the right way to go about it, to be honest. A lot of the times when I'm playing Thrasios decks, I want to be heavy on instants so that I can hold up like a counterspell. And then if not, activate Thrasios. But Thrasios is also just so generically good. If you can find a way to make infinite mana in your four color deck, you have an outlet right there. Right, right. Um, so I'm sure you can make an awesome deck with Thrasios and Vile Smasher with these colors. Um, but I would probably be more interested in starting with Tim Natana, I think. Yeah. Um, You're already running Kiki Jiki in a lot of those decks yeah. too. So like having even like a goblin sharpshooter combo uh, along with, uh, hey, talk about other goblins that you can search up, right? Sharpshooter right. plus Splinter Twin is also, sharp, see, I, that's one that I love too because sharpshooter is easy to tutor for because you have so many goblin tutors if that's what you're going for. Mm -hmm. It's a combo with Splinter Twin and sharpshooter is also just really good against other mana darks. It's just like a good card on its own. Yeah, now that we've seen the meta shift more towards a board state and everybody running three, four, or five dorks. Uh, I mean, we've seen some of the gummed up board states that have, have happened in some of your games as well. Absolutely. Uh, having a sharpshooter just be, be able to machine gun down your opponent's advantage on that one is uh, is key as well, crucial. Definitely, yeah. yeah. So yeah, and like allowing your package to be expanded of now your goblin package includes maybe a goblin sharpshooter that can also be paired with a splinter twin. And since you're in splinter twin and Kiki Jiki, there are probably some cards that will combo with both of those things. So then you can loop together your packages again there, which yeah. that's something that I really like. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's all about the redundancy in here right. too. Now you're seeing the, the real synergies that are coming up when you look at these packages and when you're adding in colors as well, what you can do with them. Uh, and uh, if we're running something like a Timna Tana on this, then at least Timna is the draw engine in your command zone as well. And even if you draw two or three cards off of Timna, that's the free card that you started the game with in your right. hand. That's the and it's also, and it's little things like, like, so Conspicuous Snoop is obviously we've talked about, it. it's a combo piece that's only two mana, it's good for many reasons, but it also just says play with the top card of your library revealed, you may cast a goblin for the top of your library. So even when it's not broken, if you have like 10 goblins in your library, every once in a while, it's just going to draw you a card, which exactly. is going to be fantastic. And if you're playing Timna, knowing the top card of your library may be relevant. If you have a forest on top, you're like, I don't need to get Timna out to jam to make sure I draw another card. That's just not really what I'm looking for right now. I can, you know, Vampiric Tutor instead or something. Right. But if you know, oh, there's a Curse Totem there on top of my library and there's a Thrasios over there, if I attack with my Timna and get through, even if I, you know, waste a creature, I'm drawing that Curse Totem that I already have that information for and can cast You it better not be playing Curse Totem in this deck. I guess you're not playing <laughs> Curse Totem in this deck. That's maybe not a great example. Well, but. I can't believe we also haven't talked about how this thing can just attack with the Timna out and draw you a card even. Right, like, yeah. If, if you just, that's the thing, like in Suspicious Snoop, you know, you it's a five mana combo all together, you know, at the maximum. But, you know, at the same time, you don't need to pay it all up front. You know, if you can just slam a turn two Snoop yep. and start getting in there, you know, maybe it draws you a couple of cards. Um, you know, it, it's just a lot of other value that is not necessarily on the card there. Yeah, and what he said about Timna, Timna is a good point of, it's so strange how Timna just makes like having small creatures in your deck better, especially if you're in like a highly, you know, combo focused meta. Yeah. Just making sure you have a couple extra tutus to be able to get through an extra card makes Timna very good. Now let's keep in mind too, we're talking about how the format is changing to be a lot more creature based. Too, so you're also stuff, gonna so. see a lot more hurt against Tim. Yeah, you're going to see more Zerdas, more Seed Boom uses. We've seen a lot more of those, but just even they're not always like, going to play against them. Yeah, and just even having like other, ma people having other Mana Dorks out. I mean, they're not usually going to block with their Mana Dork, but if they're in a, if they're in a spot where they're really going to be able to hurt you by being able to do that, yeah. yeah. There's players that will take that opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. It's worth throwing away your Mana Dork to prevent you from winning the game without it. Exactly. Oh, uh, and, every day. <laughs> and with, uh, with, Timna and Thrasios and their prevalence in the format, do you think we're going to start seeing more uh, more board wipes be played more often, especially more of the flexible board wipes like Fiery Covenant and Toxic Deluge, as well as the board wipes that just deal three damage to the board as well? I know that the two damage board wipes like Pyroclasm and Flame Sweep see play right now, but how about the, the bigger board wipes? I think so, but it's it's also it's kind of important to note that the board wipes I think are more like um, you're you're fixing the um, 
the symptom, not really the, the result. A lot of these Thrasios and Timna decks, or a lot of these Thrasios creature decks, are not winning with combat. They're winning with Demonic Concentration, Thrasios, Oracle, but they're gaining advantage through the drawing the cards. Yeah. So, yes, it, a lot, but a lot of the time, like the sweepers are a necessary part because you need to slow their engines down. But I feel like a lot of times what's going to happen is you're going to rely on that Toxic Deluge, wipe the Thrasios players' board, and they're just going to untap and play Fish Thrasios, Oracle, Consultation. Then, yeah, I guess. Um, so, yes, there. it's definitely more important to have those sweepers, but also keep in mind that their way to actually win the game is not with s creatures on a sorcery speed. They're going to win it right away. So you have to keep up that spell pierce as well. You know what I mean? Right, right. And that that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic point as well is with the prevalence of fish consult here, uh, a lot of people need to play more interaction. And right. the decks that aren't playing the kind of interaction that can stop it are really on the back foot right now. So how necessary is it to have blue in your CDH deck? 100%. I'm yeah. sorry to cut you off there, Chris, but <laughs> this is this is my thing is that if I'm playing a personal CDH deck of mine, if I don't have blue, it's not my personal CDH deck. That's kind of the bummer with Grenzo is as much as Grenzo could be pushed and as much as this is perfect for Grenzo, you're not running blue. So you're you're behind, which you can use you can play Blood Moon and things to your advantage and you know gain that advantage back, but blue is you just kind of need it in CDH. All the decks are they win with combos. You need to be able to stop combos. Yeah. To stay on the topic of, you know, Tim Datana, you know, it is their interaction for bl that lacks blue is more the the lock pieces that they have. Chains of right. Mephistopheles. Have uh, you, stuff like Thalia to slow you down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's there's it's not that, you know, these other decks aren't going to be able to interact. But with a combo like Fish Consult, where the, the creature removal is not what you need to rely on, something's got to give, right? You know, there's got to be something else that you, you have to be able to do in those cases. And for me, my answer is just play blue. It's the simplest thing that you can do. It's one of the most versatile things you can do in terms of what other packages you have available to you too. Mm -hmm. Unless you play Thrasios. And the way that I kind of see it is, think about it in normal formats when there's the best deck in the format and there's like some deck that you think beats the best deck in the format. Like when we had Hogak Summer. Did you play Hogak or did you play the deck that could beat Hogak? If you right. wanted to win, you probably played Hogak. That's kind of what blue is in CDH. You can play the deck that beats the blue deck if you want, but if you want to have the highest win percentage, you're playing four players. It's probably just best to play the deck that can win no matter what with blue cards and have forcible backup and stuff Absolutely. like that. Absolutely. Hey, I, I played during Eldrazi Winter in modern. Okay, so. yes. My <laughs> favorite Pro Tour. My favorite <laughs> Pro Tour of insane, all time. But why would you play a deck that could beat that deck? Like, you <laughs> can't just play that deck. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so so that that's a lot of what CDH here is as well. Do you... Do you try and dethrone the king or do you try and be the king, be right? The king, like yeah. the, the, those are the, the two options that you have here. And um, now uh, if we went with something like uh, Tana Timna here and excluded blue, I feel that we'd have to lean heavier on some of white's strengths here as well. And white has been getting a lot more strengths lately in form of their hate bears. Uh, how, how do you feel about how white's prevalence in CDH has been over the past couple of sets? I think it's growing, but it's not grown enough for my taste. For me, the big draw between if you're like, so the way I normally think about it is normally I want to be playing um, like a, a like a Sultai splashing red or white. Normally that's kind of where my thought is lately in CDH. So my thoughts are my main reason for white is for silence and my main reason for red is for Doxai and Extortionist. I don't know why those are just like the height of those colors in CEDH to me. Um, so that's kind of your draw. If you want to be able to like protect your combo and you want to be playing like a creature deck without a lot of blue stuff, Silence feels really good. But also like we're, we're de play, definitely playing Doxai Extortionist because we're playing Vicious Soup. So that's that's <laughs> a, you know that's not this argument here or conversation. But now we are we've gotten a lot of new cards. I mean, there's the new um, Margda. What's her name from the from Core Twenty One? Oh, um. The four mana um, Chrome and yeah, oh, I'm so bad with names. Uh, what? Or, or no, sorry, uh, Mangara. The mono white. The, the Mangara. The Mangara. Mangara yeah, we're getting things like Mangara and um, the other one from Ikoria. Why can't I remember? I'm so bad at card names. I feel you. Um, oh my god. What does it do? Um, it's, it prevents people from casting cards that aren't in their hands. Draineth Magistrate. Draineth Thank Magistrate. You, Thank you, wow, Chris. Thank you very what much. A card. Yes. No yeah. Um, Draineth Magistrate probably is near silence, honestly, in, in in straight power level. I think that card is definitely a big pull for white. Yeah, absolutely. I, and and even some of the hate bears like uh, Tokatli Honor Guard that mm -hmm. we got with Ixalan, which is the Topor Orb on a body. Right. right. I, I I find that even making the consultation fish player play around a hate bear in play 
gives you enough turns to get more counterplay in without 100%. having to play blue as well. Yep. Yeah. No, I completely agree, and that's a that's a very good point, especially when you do something like when you when you play it's a Kali Honor Guard or something, and you know there's a Thassa Oracle player on the table, you can kind of communicate with the other players and look at that Thassa Oracle player and see them squirm for a second and yeah. see them go, oh, now I have to find something. So now you and the other two players know that the Thassa's Oracle player is ready to win, but needs to find it out. So everyone's on their toes a little bit more. Exactly. So that's kind of like how you how you push the Thassa's Oracle decks and poke them until they no longer can fight against everything. Yeah, uh, and that that's a fantastic point as well. You're sitting across from a player that you know is playing Consultation Fish. They've got three cards in hand and they're squirming, ready to get get going. And you drop a Torpor Orb or right. a, a Tukatli Honor Guard, and they're looking at Fish, Consultation, and a Counterpiece. And now thinking, okay, now I've got to go find my Chain of Vapor in right. order to go off as well. And you've got two more turns with two other players at the table to try and set that player back even further. Right. And that's when you want to be very vocal and talk to the other players and say, look at this guy. He's been moving a little bit. Let's look at this girl. Look at whoever. You know what I mean? Like they're they're like everyone keep your toes on. This is the player that can win right away. We should all be focusing and kind of shift where the, the blame is. a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people that don't play CEDH feel like there's not a lot of room for the political aspect when it comes it to CEDH. Is. But you've brought up a fantastic point. That's exactly the kind of situation that does come up in CEDH, where it's not so much about how do I win as quickly as possible, but how do I prevent everybody else from winning as quickly as possible as well? And that's the thing. Like there, there's a lot of room for politicking in CEDH, but it's just it's different. It's, right. it's instead of you know making treaties with these other players, it's really just reminding everyone who can win, telling everyone, hey, hey can- we're all trying to win as fast as possible here. Yeah. Yeah. We need to remember that we need to stop other people so that we can then win. Right. And also, I've always found in CDH, it's a lot like a fight where you never want to be the first one to throw a punch. You always want to dodge the first punch and then throw your punch. Right. You know what I mean? You always want to be the second person to go for a win. Or, the or, or ideally, you want to be, be the person that's staying out of a fight entirely oh, so right. that you've got all of your <laughs> ammo when you try and go off. Right? Bingo. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, real quick, I want to just go back to something. We talked about Dranith Magistrate for a second. And Dranith Magistrate is definitely one of the strongest cards in white. But I just wanted to bring up. One of the things that has bitten me in the ass a decent amount with that card is it's bad against Gilded Drake. If you need your commanders to play the game, if someone Gilded Drakes or Dranith Magistrate, you're so dead. It's yeah. the worst. But if you're playing Timna and Tana, you don't need your commanders. Your commanders are just engines. Yeah. So if someone Gilded Drakes or Dranith Magistrate, it's not as the end of the world as if someone Gilded Drakes your Magistrate when you're playing Thrasios deck. Right. So I think Dranith Magistrate in that style deck is it's particularly good because that's just something that I've noticed. And even then, if you're giving a three power flyer to the Tim uh, to the Tim the deck, that's not the great spot that you want to be. Right. In. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Now, uh, you you brought up Gilded Drake, which is uh, fantastic, and I don't want to get too MTG Finance into this as well, but <laughs> we've been seeing a lot of CDH staples explode in price recently. Yeah. Uh, Gilded Drake being one of them that has near tripled in price over the past. What's it? What's it at right now? I don't actually. I haven't looked. I just bought a Japanese one for ninety eight dollars, and it's only under three digits because it was Japanese. (laughs) I'm like positive of that. Right, right. I I think last I looked, which admittedly isn't recently, it was up over one forty at this point. Wow. And and this is a, a card that maybe six weeks ago, before the world started falling apart, was. Two, 217. We're Holy being shit. Oh my. That's crazy. Yeah. Wow, that's one that I'm like, man, am I thankful that I got it for $60 when like $60 is still way too much for a piece of cardboard, but. <laughs> right, right. But but like, like we mentioned, uh, before everything started falling apart, some of these CDH staples were relatively affordable. $60 yeah. is much more affordable than $200. we are seeing pieces like uh, Mox Diamond and Lion's Eye Diamond get up over $500 now i still haven't bought in my mox diamond that's so depressing that's like my one one of my last yeah. few pieces to get that's such a bummer yeah i, I i'm sitting on those two right now mox yeah. diamond and lion's eye diamond are just two of the final pieces oh that boy. i need right now so. 2021 2021 is yeah. gonna be your time yeah. i mean there's, there's just there's been so much going on uh, just between i mean simple supply and demand is really what this has been with i mean who's going into a card shop right now yeah. nobody i've got a bunch of stuff that i'm waiting to trade in that <laughs> i just i just can't it's all sitting around and i'm sure that there is some people in 
many other places that would love some of these cards that I have. You probably don't. There's a lot of junk that I'm trying to trade in right now. Um, but I mean, there's just, there's not so many trade-ins coming in. Um, you know, I've, we've seen a lot of like bigger retailers, you know, upping the amount of store credit they're giving away more recently for stuff that you trade in now. Um, you know, I, I think until we are completely open, we're going to see these price spikes continue, and especially as our format keeps growing too. Yep. We're going to keep seeing these prices go up until there's just more availability. Well, uh, our format has seen a lot of attention during lockdown with the rest of paper magic kind of on hold. Uh, EDH and competitive EDH have had very healthy online communities and That's playing true. via webcam is easier than ever right now. And Cam, I know while you couldn't be in person, you played via webcam with the rest of the guys as well. Have you been playing random games online via webcam too? When I can, you know, I'll certainly try to. It's, it's admittedly less often than, than I would hope, but um, you know, we've done we've done things with our patrons too, where we say, "Hey guys, you know, we're going to have a big a big play party today." Yeah, yeah. To be honest, I I would love to do more. The editing the show it takes a long time. <laughs> it takes like basically all my free time right now. Preaching to the choir uh, on this. One. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I would love to. Yeah, we, as Cameron said, we did do something for our patrons where we just like had everyone hop on our Discord and we just like, set up a bunch of cameras and did a bunch of games throughout the day. Yeah. We would love to do more of that because I think that's the best way to get an accurate read of what the CDH meta is. Looking at the CDH YouTube channels. Keep in mind that like we all like curate what the games are. Like I'm I'm looking for decks that interact together that it's not like a complete blowout. Although, it's gonna be a good game that's yeah, between yeah, a control the, deck, a creature deck, a, a lock deck. Right. Um but yeah, I think that's the best way to get an accurate reading of what people are playing because I think you'll find that it's it's different than what you read online, I think. There's yeah. a lot more Kess, there's a lot more Zer. I don't know why for some reason those two decks are much more popular, I, I see, like in, in play and mm -hmm. actual than and on like online what the best deck is. Right, right. Uh, and you, you brought up a great point there as well. In EDH, there's very little recording of what a meta looks like. Uh, and I felt that that's always been a problem with all power levels of EDH, whether you're playing casual, mid power or C EDH, because we don't have many sanctioned events, we can't get really a, a look on what the meta actually looks like. You have to get out there and you have to play in order to find out what people are playing and what's prevalent right now. We know that things like Consultation Fish are, uh, are, are the boogeyman in the format right now, but are they being played everywhere and are they being played in 99% of the decks? We saw some great feedback from the Commander Rules Committee recently where they took a lot of CDH player feedback in consideration for their ban of Flash as well. If we got more solid information on a CEDH meta, we would be able to see where the format is stagnating, where there's too much overlap. And in that case, would you advocate something like a Thassa's Oracle ban or a Demonic Consultation ban? I, I would not. I would yeah. not. So, I mean, I I, I will admit, it, it can get a little tiring. You know, every every win condition now is Thassa's Oracle. How many flavors of Thassa's Oracle can we get out? Or how many ways can, can we uh, Hermit Druid our, our library away? <laughs> can we just draw all the cards off Thrasios? You know, there's there's a lot of different flexibility to, um, to the fish in that way. Um, that being said, I don't know how terrible of a thing that is i mean vintage is a beloved format there's a lot of like the same kind of cards going around vintage in the same way that there is with cedh in mm -hmm. this way everyone's playing black lotus everyone's trying to i mean i guess you could argue there's a lot of more various win conditions in vintage in that way too at least that are seen play yeah. as opposed to you know everyone just playing like the exact same fish um but i also kind of think it, it allows us to narrow in and focus in a little bit more on what we should be fighting against. Mm -hmm. um, not in terms of a ban, I just mean in game, you know, like we, you know exactly what the combo is, what to expect from the combo. And with how many people are playing it, you don't need to necessarily waste slots in your deck to try to fight against everything else. You know, one of the problems with Flash Hulk was that every deck was playing cards that were going to be interact only with Flash Hulk. Exactly. Yeah. So, right. you, so in, if you were playing in uh, non-Hulk meta, you draw your um, Graph Digger's Cage and go, well, holy cow, what am I supposed to do with this now? Then right. This isn't going to affect anybody. It's just dead. Yeah. Um, so it, it, it's kind of nice when you have fewer things to have to worry about. You can really hone in on what those things are going to be and not have like that, that you know, 
Hearthstone kind of worry. I have to run this silver bullet in my main deck yeah. because I'm going to get blown out by something. And it's also, CDH is just a broken format. There's always going to be a boogeyman. There's always going to be a top dog. There's always going to be like a best deck. So just like banning the best deck, that works for standard if you want to do that, but it just doesn't work for CDH because it's just something else is just going to take its place. Like, so... I don't think it's a great idea to ban Fastest Oracle, although many, many decks do win with Fastest Oracle. How they get there is all different. They're not, you know what I mean? So it's, they're also playing different. They're using different colors. They're also different decks. So all the games win with, you know, Fastest Oracle, it's a Monarch Constellation, but the process is so much different. That's the fun part about Magic. Yeah, and I, I find that CDH is a format that evolves regularly and evolves a lot faster than many other format to do because there are so many great minds out there thinking along those lines. If I need to beat what's best right now, how do I do it faster? How do I do it more efficiently? What's the next line to shut that down? And honestly, that's one of the things that I love about CEDH as a format. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. Right. Me too. The whole community aspect of it is pretty great. Fantastic. Uh, and speaking of community, I know that you guys have a Patreon and a Discord in addition to your channel. I uh, want you to tell everybody a little bit about it, and I'll make sure that there's a link in the description below to your channel so that everybody can check out your stuff. Sure, yeah. We have a Patreon, patreon.com slash play to win. We have a couple different tiers there where we give up merch at discounted prices. We have a Discord link. We have a couple other you know, bonus videos. So every month we do one bonus video that's just like an extra game or something. Um, we also have a Discord where we talk about a whole bunch of stuff. Really, it's just kind of just become like a CDH chat room where we just like chat and talk about new cards and talk about whatever. We set up games through our Discord as well. Um, yeah, and those are pretty much the best ways that you can support us right now. Yeah. Fantastic. Subscribing on YouTube too. It's a pro <laughs> click. Let me tell everybody out there. So, <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us today. Had a great time. Uh, I think a lot of people are going to learn a little bit more about CEDH thanks to our discussion here. And I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of Snoop lines are going to show up in some decks. And hopefully when you guys kick off your new season, which I know is coming up soon, uh, yeah. we start seeing some of these new cards in there. Definitely, we're looking for a conspicuous Snoop deck as as best we can. Whether that's um, whether that's Grenzo or whether that's Tim Natana or whether that's some kind of blue pod deck, I think we're we'll definitely find some homes for it. We're snooping around a couple yeah. of different <laughs> options right now. <laughs> All right, and on that note, thank you very much, guys. Thanks everybody for the tuning in. Subscribe, like, and we'll have more of these coming up soon. Cam, Dylan, thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. You a salute? No finger gun. Oh, sh that's your thing. <laughs> I'm leaving that in. <laughs> and here's the deck we ended up brewing. We landed on Tana Timna Blood Pod, using Conspicuous Snoop and other goblin lines to enhance the already strong shell in CDH. We've adapted it a little bit to be creature heavier, and we've ensured that we've got tutor pieces to get this line and others. The more versatility, the better. As always, with these do a brew sessions, we like to end off every episode with a unique brew and a unique deck list. Check out the full link in the description below. If you want to see more guests on more podcasts like this on the channel, then subscribe and let me know in the comments below who you'd like to see next. Till next time, good luck and have fun.